Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Krupp. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I'll be your host today. Today, we are sponsored by Schiffer Craft Publishing, and we've got something new today, thanks to Schiffer. They are going to give us um, the opportunity that you can enter a drawing for, um, for a book, not just any book, for Tommy Scanlon's book, Tapestry Design, Basics and Beyond, Planning and Weaving with Confidence. There will be the, oh, it's in there already. In the chat is the link. You go to that link and then you can um, sign up for the drawing. She, they're going to give away two books and they're going to do it between now and May 31st. So thank you, Schiffer. How wonderful. If you need a book on fiber, arts and crafts, and a million other topics, check out Schiffer Publishing and they probably have it. We will take questions today. It's the last 15 minutes. Please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. Love your comments in the chat, but we can't see the questions. Today, we have Tommy Scanlon. Tommy is a professor emeritus at the University of Georgia, Dahlonega, where she began the weaving program in the 1970s. She explored different ways to create imagery with weaving until embracing hand woven tapestry as her medium of choice three decades ago. She is the author of The Nature of Things, Essay of a Tapestry Weaver, and the book we just mentioned, Tapestry Design Basics and Beyond, Planning and Weaving with Confidence. We are so excited to have you here today, Tammy. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me, Kathy? We can hear you great. Okay. So let me ask the first question, which is, what is your favorite tea? Well, when we talked about this earlier, I flippantly said my favorite tea is coffee, but <laughs> that's okay I have, too. <laughs> I have bought into the tea and I do have ginger tea with me today, which I often have in the afternoon. So ginger tea is my favorite. All right. If I'm not ginger drinking tea. coffee. <laughs> so how did you get started in fibers? I started like many children did with a potholder loom when I was, oh, 11 or 12 years old, made a few of those and didn't think any more about fibers because I didn't have access to learning or uh, finding out about weaving or any other fiber process. Now, I take that back. My mother crocheted, my mother and grandmothers quilted, but that didn't sort of capture my attention. It was when I was student teaching and my supervising teacher said, we're gonna do a, um, we're gonna do um, a little bag cardboard weaving. So we wove round and round with the students and, and that really began to um, intrigue me. When I was then teaching high school art in uh, the next years, uh, soon afterwards, I put together frame looms and my students and I hammered nails on both ends, ran string from side to side and they wove and I wove and we all loved it. Even the big burly football players had a great time with it. So that, that was where I began my path with fiber was through teaching. <laughs> well, we're gonna look at a couple of your paintings here you could easily be known as a painter. Um, do you see your this artwork as a means to an end or are they standalone too? Um, primarily there's means to an end and the end is tapestry weaving, but I do enjoy uh, drawing and painting and I have always. So I have occasionally exhibited my drawings and my paintings and those are mostly rolled up on shelves and stuck into portfolios, never to see the light of day. But drawing and painting and printmaking are all important to me for uh, design purposes, design making. Oh, those works are just beautiful. It, I you. can easily see those being what you do. And it's just amazing how you translate those into fiber. Thanks. 
you were one of the first people that I was aware of that did tapestry diaries. And I, it's like you've, you've started this whole craze because so many people are doing it now. It really took off. Um, how did it start for you? How did you come up with this idea? I had thought for a long time about doing something every day in weaving where I didn't have a predetermined plan necessarily, but oh. I would weave a small amount each day and stop. And then I, the next day I would come back and I would weave another small amount and stop and do that over a course of a length of time. I had that thought in my mind for several years. And finally, one year, you know how one does. You finally say to yourself, self, do something about this or just shut the heck up about thinking about it. So the month of May in 2008, I decided that I would finally try it. I set up a, a narrow warp on one of my frame looms because I was going to be traveling a lot during the month to do some workshops. And I didn't want to set myself up right away with failure saying, I'm going to do this every day. And then, oops, I can't do it because I don't have it with me. So in 2008, in the month of May, I started my tapestry diary journey not knowing that anyone else in the world had ever done anything like that. I didn't think it was anything particularly earth-shaking or revolutionary or uh, anything like that. I just had not heard of anyone who had taken that as a process, as a practice. I later learned that one of my friends, Jerry Fortner, has been doing daily weavings, not tapestry, but weavings on her loom every day since 2005. So Jerry Fortner uh, has and is still, I presume, doing these uh, daily weavings that she then assembles into larger, longer, wider, um, multi-folding accordion book kinds of, of things. So if anyone is curious about daily weaving, look at Jerry Fortner's website. Another tapestry artist who I didn't know about who was doing daily weaving is Kay Lawrence, who's in Australia. And I learned about her through um, uh, Michaela Sador. Michaela did an article for Fiber Art Now a few years ago about tapestry diaries and my work was included. And as she was putting together material for that, she told me about Kay Lawrence. I later got in touch with her and found out that she had done tapestry diary sorts of things over a course of time in, two, uh, in 1979 and also in 1980. So my journey with tapestry diaries started in 2008 with that one month. And since 2009, I've done a, uh, one each year. Um, in a, in a continuous kind of way. So I was not the first. There are a number of people who've, uh, I didn't know that, you know, but um, there are a number of people who are doing tapestry diaries and other kinds of daily practice with fiber. And I think getting a lot of, um, a lot out of it. Jan Austin is one who's, who's continued hers almost as long as I have. Well, then when you do work on your tapestry diary, do you weave a little bit on this loom that has your tapestry and then you go over and work on whatever your main project is? Sort of, sort of along those lines. My tapestry diary is on a loom that's at home and my um, other tapestry work mostly takes place in a separate, uh, separate house that's my studio. So I have a process of morning ritual. I do morning pages, I drink coffee, I do some um, exercise, I go for a walk, and then I go weave my day. I call it weaving my day. That might take five minutes. It might take a minute and a half. It doesn't um, matter. As long as I've committed to doing that increment for each day, um, the tapestry doesn't care. The loom doesn't care how much time I spend on it. But by the end of the year, I usually have a 
uh, tapestry that's around 60 to 90 inches long by 12 inches wide. Every year since 2009, except for one year when I did separate uh, month pieces, every year I tie on to the last warp from the pre the prior year, uh. and then pull my pull my warp through the reed and the heddles and wind <clears> it on the beam <throat> and tie it up and get ready to go. So That's to kind me, of symb symbolic it, to do it that it, way. It, Exactly. It's it's my link. It's my tie from one year to the next. One year finishes, the next year begins, but they're linked. They're tied. Well, speaking of the different years that you've done, we've got images here of your diaries and how they evolved over the years. The one on the, the far left is 2009. The one in the middle is 2012. And then the one on the right is 2021. Would you talk some about the evolution? Sure. <laughs> um, 2009 was the first year that I did the whole year's tapestry diary. And of course, in weaving, you start at one end and you go till you get to the other end. For some reason in 2009, I decided that I wanted to do 10 uh, days across rather than seven. Why I decided that, I don't know. Anyway, but I didn't want to do interlocks. I wanted to do slit tapestry. And I knew that if I was doing slit tapestry, I would need to stagger those rectangles and squares so that I didn't have just open slits running all the way through the piece. So I, as I began the year, I thought I need to have a few thoughts of uh, what I've called rules ways that I'm going to proceed so that I don't have to reinvent what I'm doing every day. Mm -hmm. I wanted this to be a daily practice, one that became a habit, one that became a um, almost like a ritual, I guess, or a routine. Maybe routine is a better word than ritual. Ritual seems too important. Anyway, so I wanted this uh, routine. So I set myself mm -hmm. rules. One rule was that I would use only scraps of weft from past tapestries. I wouldn't pull out any new weft from a fresh cone or a fresh skein of yarn. The next rule I gave myself was that I would give a, an indication of the date by a weaverly mark, like pick and pick stripes or horizontal um, stripes. So those that I would do each day would total the day. So if it was the 13th day, I would figure out a way to make 13 marks within that little space that I was weaving. On the sixth day, you can see a, on that detail, you can see a lot of those um, spots and dots and pick and pick. On the sixth day of January, this was when I was still teaching at North Georgia. After I had retired for full time, I was still teaching the weaving classes. Anyway, that sixth day of January was the first day of class that semester, spring semester. And I was so exhausted when I came in. I didn't weave. And the next day I got up and I thought, oh, no, already I've messed up. I didn't weave my day. And I thought to myself, OK, this is going to happen all year long because I'm going to go to workshops. I'm going to go to conferences. I'm going to be away at artist retreats. I need to show my days away and then continue on once I return home. So that's what the white rectangles are in the 2009 Tapestry Diary. They're sprinkled throughout the year, and I can see at a glance which days I was away from home. That resolved the issue in my mind of the missing days. So in 2010, I was going to be away for an extended time. That's the one in the middle. Um, I was going to West Dean College in um, the UK to study for six weeks, study tapestry. I was also teaching at Penland School of Craft for about two and a half weeks and some other teaching and some other artist retreats. So I thought, all right, for 2010, I think I'll approach this differently. 
for my days away, I'm going to quite literally leave blanks. I'm going to leave empty warps. So as you look at the 2010, the middle piece in this slide, those long beige areas are skinny linen warps, if you saw it close up. Those were held in place um, a little, little like quarter inch uh, strips of Bristol board were woven in place so that I could keep building up the same distance, the equivalent of a day's worth, but then I would be able to come back and fill in with solid weaving once I'd returned. At the end of the year, I could just slide all of those strips of, um, of Bristol board out and leave those empty warps. Then the 2019 one on the other side was uh, a few years ago, 2015, I began to think, I do imagery in my regular weaving. So I'm gonna figure out a way to incorporate imagery into my uh, tapestry diaries. So each month I began to insert a, an image that I had either drawn or painted or photographed from something. And I've usually set up kind of a thematic thing with what I find growing seasonally or um, out as I'm walking, uh, pick up a leaf and it happens to be April, for instance. And that's what I might weave uh, for that month. Surrounding those monthly images are the days. So I'm continuing to do my day by day thing as, um, as the years progress. And every year, it's a new challenge, Kathy. It's, it's really um, been quite interesting to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do this year to sort of make up my new rules, my new rules of, of the game? I love it that you make your own rules. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one characteristic of your work is that I just love. And that is that you represent hard objects, but you're doing it in a very soft material. Um, and this next image is because of memory is a perfect example of this. Um, and I have to tell you, if this is ever on display and it disappears, I took it. I love this piece. And I know I'm not alone. I know everybody in the office wants this piece. But would you talk about this work, you know, where it came sure. from, the idea behind it? Yeah, um, I'm going to read you just a little bit from one of my books about this work. It was oh, based on uh, a design uh, photograph and then paintings that I did of a detail of a chimney a chimney ruin that's at the Lillian E. Smith Center in Clayton, Georgia, or near Clayton, Georgia. Lillian Smith was a mid 20th century social justice advocate, civil rights advocate. And the center that bears her name is now owned by Piedmont University. Uh, but she is buried beside the uh, old chimney ruin. And from what I understand from her niece, she loved that chimney that was one of her favorite spots. And so her grave is beside the chimney. When I've been at the Lillian E. Smith Center, which is now an artist retreat center, uh, I've made loads of photographs of this chimney. I've looked at these stones. I've felt the stones. I've, I've thought about the quote that's on her grave marker. And the quote is from one of her writings uh, found in one of her books, The Journey. And the quote says, death can kill a man. That is all it can do to him. It cannot end his life because of memory. And so thinking about that quote, it was something that I just felt that I wanted to do. Um, it's not just a reminder of the inspiring moments I've had at the center but more because I believe that memory is held in stones as well as in human minds. The memory of ages and forces shows in the stones and is more permanent than the memories of humans can ever be. So that's, that's just a little excerpt from, um, from my book. As far as making weaving 
of something hard look soft? I don't know the answer to that. So <laughs> this is a, a long way of saying um, to your question, how can I make it look uh, hard in this soft medium? I don't know, Kathy. I just try my best. You And you do it beautifully. You do it absolutely beautifully. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you. You have published two books. Um, one we're going to talk about right now is The Tapestry Design Basics and Beyond, Planning and Weaving with Confidence. Um, it, it is so well thought out. And I was in the book's introduction, I was reading that you were talking about um, teaching your students with your husband. And you, your husband said to you, what do you hope someone sees in your work? What, what do you hope they will get from it? And I was curious, let me ask you the same question about the book. What do you hope someone who reads this book will get from it? What I hope someone who reads this book will get from it is the thought, I can do this. It's not necessarily easy, but there are methods that I can try. There are things that I can play with. I can explore and I can gain confidence. That's what I would like for someone to get from the book is that everyone can design, everyone can create, everyone can make. It might not meet your expectations yet, but I say be gentle with yourself, be um, patient with yourself, give yourself time to explore, give yourself time to, to make a mess, to take the journey. And that's what I would hope that people would get from the book. I talk about design basics because I taught about design basics when I was at the university in um, design classes and also with art education classes. I think one of the really important lessons that I've learned from teaching art education classes is that everyone has um, a starting point, no matter how experienced, how much uh, art making you've done in the past, everyone starts somewhere. And I feel like once you start, it's easier to continue. As long as you keep that desire to start bound up in your head, uh, it's just going to be bound up in your head. But once you start doing something, the next thing comes and the next thing comes and the next thing comes. And they're not all going to be great. And they might not even be very good. But until you do them, you can't move on to the next thing. So anyway. Another long story on how, oh, what do I hope people get from this book? I hope they get some confidence from it. I love that. I love you can't, until you, you, you mess this up, you can't get beyond it and do the good stuff. That's, I love that. That's a great way of looking at things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that when I'm teaching my new students. <laughs> do, do steal it. Go ahead. I've stolen okay. it from other people. It's not <laughs> original with me. Um, one of the things I loved in this book was that you use so many different artists work in there. Um, everything from Pat Williams, who I absolutely love. I hope Pat's watching today to my friend, Terry Bryson, who's a relatively new weaver. And I just love that you have that whole range of different artists. And it's also very generous of you. So can you talk some about why you did it that way? Oh, gosh, yeah, because the students I've had and the people who've been in, in my workshops and the people who I've known from my own beginning um, are just amazing to me, as well as those people whose work I admired when I was first getting involved in tapestry. They were so they being the, the more experienced tapestry artist who've been working for decades, some of them in the field. Everyone who I asked if they would be willing to share their work was so gracious and allowed me to use images of their work. I wish I could have asked everyone whose work I admire. I really do. 
The same with people who were less experienced. They were very gracious in letting me use their work, not because I feel like their work is any less than that of someone who's been weaving tapestry for 30, 40 years. It's not. It's, it's equally, um, equally strong because each person whose work is in that book feel strongly about what they've made. They feel strongly about the image they developed and they had the perseverance, uh, the patience um, to weave it in tapestry, which is, uh, you know, there are a lot of slow arts, but tapestry is one of the slower ones. So um, I, I really appreciated the people, the Atlanta study group who were, um, uh, taking part in the book, as well as people like Barbara Heller and um, Susan Martin Maffei and other people who've been been weaving for a long, long time. Now, so many of these folks either have been or are going to be on on textiles and tea. Also, um, uh, Rebecca Mezoff, I know she did the um, introduction, right? She, she did. did. The, she did the forward, forward right? Yeah, and oh, she's great. another diary weaver, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Nancy Duggars in there and it's just amazing because you really get to see the different styles, you know, and that's one reason why I mentioned Pat is she's, when you see her work, you know, it's hers. And just to see how everybody approaches it so differently, it really is generous on your part. I mean, you really could have made this about you and you didn't, you opened it up. So this goes into my next question and I hope you don't think it's too sappy, but <laughs> When I was reading this book, I was thinking there, there's so many ways that people teach. You know, you have the folks who are really enthusiastic and they're like, okay, we can do this. And then you have others who are very instructive, like, okay, we're going to do this. And now we're going to do this. And now we're going to do this. And all these ways are wonderful and they work beautifully. But when I was reading your book, I just felt like you were saying like, there was this gentle suggestion of here, take my hand. And we're going to go explore this together. It was just a real welcoming, gentle way of doing it. And you talked some about it already, but was this kind of your thought as you were working on this? I think it was, Kathy, because that's the way I've approached um, most of the teaching that I've done. I've, I've tried to set up things uh, that I'm teaching about in such a way that people can be successful. So I, I, want, I want people to try things, uh, but I don't want them to get discouraged. I don't want to hold their hand so much that they feel like I'm totally guiding them. Mm. But I, I want people to feel they can have success. And maybe some of the teaching I did, I mentioned the art education classes before, some of the, the teaching that I did in art ed class was directed in that way specifically because many of the people who took the class were in early childhood education. They had not, many of them had an art class since they were in elementary school themselves. And <clears throat> I was hoping to help them find ways that they could take art into their classroom, feel that they could be successful with guiding children to explore, um, not go into a classroom with pre-printed handouts for kids to fill in and ideas that <clears throat> you can't go outside the lines. I wanted them to feel they could break those lines and everything would be great. Everything would be lovely. I wanted them to have projects that they could do that they could they could succeed at without making a predetermined thing. So I think in some ways that's the way I've approached the book and that I've approached the workshops that I've taught through the years. Now there may be some of my former students in from workshops here who would say, no, Tommy didn't do it that way. She said, you will. <laughs> You will do meet and separate exactly like I tell you to. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe I should be reading these chats over here to see <laughs> if anybody's saying, hey, that's not I what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Does it totally differently. 
Well, one thing I, I, I follow you on Facebook and it's been so much fun because you post these good morning Delonica. And I love them because you just never know what you're going to see. I mean, right. some, a lot of days it's really beautiful flowers or, you know, a pretty, you know, something in the sky or something like that. But some days it's really weird things like a, a doll shoe or a broken lock or just something that hmm, that doesn't belong there. What is that doing there kind of thing? So I was curious, is this how you come up with some ideas? Um, does this impact on your work, do you think? I think it impacts on my work in that it keeps me looking. And my work is involving, uh, the, the work that I do involves um, seeing things. Hmm. You know, I work, I'm, I'm a realistic uh, or pictorial, not not totally realistic, but I'm a pictorial tapestry weaver. So that involves looking at things, finding images that catch my eye and then exploring them with drawing or painting or making prints. So the um, advent of iPhone <laughs> has been a real, real boon for me because I used to take lots and lots of film photo with a point and shoot camera and spend, I guess, hundreds of dollars getting those things developed, you know, run over to Walgreens and stick them in the, the uh, photo place and get them developed and get them back and look at them and think, oh, well, that wasn't too good or that didn't <laughs> capture what I thought I was seeing. So having a smart camera or a smart, smartphone with a camera makes it so easy to just pull it out and snap a picture, look at it and say, mm, that's OK, I'll I'll save that or mm, that's bad. I'll just delete that. Let it let it go on. But what captures my eye, Kathy, on these Good Morning Dahlonega or Good Morning the Folk School or Good Morning Penland, wherever I am, is that thing that makes me do a double take. I don't go out looking for anything. It's every day there's something that catches my eye and makes me maybe stop and look closer or makes me turn around and say, what was that? And those are usually the things that I've photographed and that become my good morning, wherever I am, sorts of things. Well, it's gotten me to do it. I, <laughs> good. It made me realize how I don't pay much attention. <laughs> but uh -huh. even now, you know, I'm out and I'm like, oh, this is a good morning Delonica picture or, right. you know, and, and so I thank you for that, is that it really has yeah. gotten me to start looking more. Well, thanks. That I, I appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Um, you've inspired so many people. You know, I of all the tapestry weavers, they always talk about Tommy Scanlon helped them do this, or they got this from Tommy, or whatever. So, who inspired you? Who ins used to inspire you, and who inspires you now? I will tell you four different aspects of my life where I find inspiration. The first is from family. Mm -hmm. My mother was a great inspiration for me. She lost her husband, my father, when she was 38 years old and he was 39. He died tragically in an accident. And she raised my sister and me and sent us both to college and encouraged us in whatever we could do. So talk about inspiration of strength and resilience. Um, that came from my mother. Another inspiration is my sister. Hmm. Not even sure I can say this without crying. My sister has lost two husbands. She has um, lived with both husbands through uh, their battles with cancer. And she has shown such grace under fire and such kindness and such strength. So she is, is truly an inspiration for me. My husband, who is so supportive, so encouraging, and puts up with my um, desire to run away for a week at an artist retreat or go teach uh, another workshop. And he's, he's a, a big inspiration. So family has, has been an inspiration. 
Other inspirations have been teachers and mentors. Bob Owens, who was my first art teacher, he became my mentor um, and later a colleague at, at North Georgia. He was a great inspiration. Edwina Bringle, who oh. I've talked about a lot whenever I get a chance to um, talk in, in instances like this. Edwina was my first real weaving teacher at Penland in 1975. So I learned from her the thought of take what you can, use what you can of that and throw the rest away. In other words, keep learning, keep learning. Not everything will fit, but some things will. If it doesn't, don't feel bad about moving on to something else. And then with tapestry, Archie Brennan and Susan Martin Maffe have, have been my um my main inspirations and, and main guides. Unfortunately, Archie's no longer living, but the wonderful book that Schiffer has recently published by Brenda Olson of Archie's words and essays by other people is, um, is helping me continue that inspiration from, from Archie. And then um, students are inspirations. I always get... Um, get a lot of ideas, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, wonderful uh, inspiration from students and then the colleagues, like the colleagues you mentioned who were um, in, included in the book, who were, um, who were there. So those are my inspirations. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. <clears throat> well, what's next for you? Another book, more teaching. Yeah, well, a uh, little bit of all of the above. I'm going on an artist retreat in a couple of weeks to Wild Acres in uh, little Switzerland, North Carolina, a place I've never, never been before. Well, I've been to Wild Acres, but I haven't been on artist retreat there. Um, going to Convergence this summer to do a workshop. And I may be doing a, a little bit more online teaching. I've, I've done a couple of classes through the folk school, through their online classes. And maybe another book in the works down the way and some more articles coming. Well, good. Um, you're going to have an exhibit with Pat Williams and... Jennifer Sargent. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Jennifer Sargent. And that's at the Clayton Center. Clayton Center, at Dan Danso Gallery at the Clayton Center for the Arts, um, Murray, um, Mary Marysville, College, Marysville. Marysville College near Knoxville. And that's going to be July 1 through the end of July. So it'll be up during Convergence. And I think it's a stop on one of the tours. That, well, uh, that's going to be an amazing exhibit. I can't, I cannot wait to see that. Yeah. All right, Just, we've got tons of questions. Should we go to those? Sure. All right. Um, somebody was saying the 2021 tapestry looks like it has 11 images rather than 12. Is there a story with that? Yes, I had major surgery and missed a month of weaving. Oh, yep. good question, Jennifer. Good eye, Jennifer. <laughs> um, are the design principles in your book applicable to weavings other than tapestry? Ramona yes. Abernathy painting. That's a great question, Ramona. Yes. Hey, Ramona. She was in a workshop in Tallahassee with me once upon a time. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, they are. They are basic principles of art and design, and they're applicable with weaving, photography, drawing, painting, any any kind of designing. Now I've specifically talked about them for tapestry and how they would apply in tapestry, but um, yeah, they're applicable for any any other weaving as well. Okay. Um, hi, Tommy. This is from Karen LeBlanc. Can you talk about if and or how you incorporate other fiber arts into your woven pieces? I do not incorporate other fiber arts into my woven pieces. Okay. Um, and... I have in the past. I have incorporated beading, bead weaving in the past, but at this point, my uh, concentration is simply on um, 
handwoven tapestry in a um, pretty straightforward kind of way. Uh, some wonderful th other things are being done by other people. So, um, you know, if you want to do that, go for it. It will be great. Can't hear you, Kathy. I'm sorry. Um, I have a dog barking in the background. So oh. <laughs> um, Betty Womack says, does each geometric shape represent a daily weaving? Each, uh, in my tapestry diaries, each geometric shape is a different day. Okay. All right. Yep. Barbara Farnoffs, at, what did you weave in the Weave Your Day that had meaning for you about your artistic mind or state of mind? How did you interpret your Weave a Day weavings? Um, I'm not quite sure what's being asked, but I will say that uh, in two of the tapestry diaries in 2012, for instance, every day I would weave a little symbolic kind of thing of something I saw that day. Mm -hmm. um, and it had to be very simplified, very small, like a little yellow shape that was kind of squash shaped. Um, one morning when I went to the farmer's market and bought squash. So most of the time, the little squares or rectangles are simply uh, a color that's chosen by the cast of a die. I, I use a, I throw a die to pick out the color that I'm gonna weave for the day. Do you really? I do. Oh, yeah. that's great. Oh, that's a great. <laughs> yeah, I assign, um, I use just one die. Um, so I assign a color to one, two, three, four, five, and six, primary color and secondary colors. So I've got several reds, several yellows, several blues, oranges, greens, and violets. So I roll the die. If it turns up one, one pip on the die, that means I'm going to weave red. So my choice for the day is made by that die cast. Which red it is that I'm going to use of my several reds, I'll make that choice myself. So that's that's been kind of a fun way to do the last, I think, four years of tapestry diary parts each day. Well, I have to say, your tapestry diaries are much more involved than I had thought. There's <laughs> so much more to this than I did not know. Um, I knew this was going to come up. Uh, Judy wants to know about the sculpture over your left shoulder. I'm assuming Which it's the one? hand. Yeah, I'm assuming that's yeah. what you're talking about. This was presented to me at Penland the last year I taught at Penland, 2019, by my students. It's holding a, a bobbin. And this sculpture was done by the man who was one of the uh, instructors. And it was done um, as a presentation piece because that was my retirement from teaching. Although I've kind of gone back on that now, but anyway. Good for us. <laughs> I love that. I love it. How wonderful. Judy, good question. I'm glad you asked about that. <laughs> What a wonderful gift. Oh my it gosh. was. That's amazing. Yeah, we were there for two weeks and they were able to get together and whisper to each other and make this plan and get together with that clay instructor, sculpture instructor, and pull this off. That's wonderful. What a oh. wonderful gift. Yeah. Um, Jean Williams wants to know, where can we see a list of your online classes? Uh, nowhere right now because they're not planned. Um, if I teach any more online, it will be through John Campbell Folk School, and they will be doing their class listing. Um, they've just finished up this year's round. Those would be found on the John C. Campbell Folk School website, probably not until like maybe January of 23, um, maybe starting December. Mm, okay. Um, Gail McLamory wants to know what are your go-to yarns and do you dye your own yarns? I do some dyeing. Um, there's some dyed ones right here behind me. Mm -hmm. um, those are dyed with natural dyes, but I don't 
dye everything I weave with. My go-to yarns are about three or four different yarns, uh, mainly wool for the tapestry. I use a cotton stain twine for the uh, warp or a linen, uh, like a rug linen. Either of those are primarily for my warps. My wools are from North Fjord fiber and um, that's um, sold through, it's a Norwegian yarn, but sold in the US through North Fjord fiber. Also um, the ALF yarn, that's what's behind me here. This is through Kathy Todd Hooker's Between and et cetera. Mm. Um, I started using, ooh, drop that, um, array yarn wool from uh, GIST. I've started using that for tapestry. And I also use Weaver's Bazaar wools. So those range in size from a two ply, the North Fjord fiber is a, is a two ply yarn that's a little bit larger to um, fairly small yarns that I can blend. I usually blend several strands oh. to, get, to get the kind of color mixtures I want. Can you, can you spell that North, whatever North? N-O-R-S-K. M J O R D fibers, okay. Norsk Fjord fibers. All right. I know people are going to ask. Yes. Uh, Carol Davinsky wants to know do you just do you weave from the front to the back or back to the front? I and how do you handle the weft tails? Yeah, I weave from the front and my weft tails are hitched or pigtailed to the back. Okay. And they stay there. They don't, nothing happens to them. I'm trying to see a loose one. I don't have a loose one here to show you the back. It looks looks like a Rhea rug on the back, but I just clip them off short. Uh, Mary I don't Holm, clip them off flush. I just clip them off, you know, maybe an inch long. Oh, okay. Uh, Mary Holm wants to know: Do you write a description or any kind of notes for each day's weaving? Do you keep a journal like that? Uh, I did early on when I started doing tapestry diaries, I do not now other than record the color um, that my dye roll told me. So oh, I do okay. keep a running tally of that, or it's not a tally really, it's just a running record of, of what I um, rolled for the day. <laughs> Uh, Ramona Abernathy Payne just said that, and I have to agree with you, Ramona, this is so true. Tammy, ta ugh, Tommy wants, always makes me want to, to weave tapestry, though it's not my medium. <laughs> you do. You, I was like, I want to do that. Uh, I have to remind myself it won't look like that. So that's okay. You got to do it the first one, right. then the next one, then the next one. That's the one. Yeah. There's that little detail of, if I don't ever get started, I'm never going to get that good. That's it. Yep. That's it. One thing I'm curious about is you have embraced, um, and maybe this is from teaching, social media, the you know internet, digital. Did that come pretty easy for you? Um, some did. Yeah. In 1996, Kathy Todd Hooker started a Yahoo group oh. and a, a tapestry group. And that was my introduction. And I, I don't know if Kathy's here uh, or not, but Kathy Todd Hooker has, has done a lot for the tapestry world uh, through her teaching and through things like the, um, she's currently doing a Wednesday afternoon Zoom for anyone in the world who wants to join in. And um, anyway, in 96, Kathy started this Yahoo group and I became a member of that group and we had lots of uh, conversations. So that, that was my beginning. I started Facebook a few years back, we started using Facebook. Um, Lynn Hart, a tapestry friend of mine, encouraged me to, to use Instagram. So I started that maybe five years ago, started using Instagram. Um, I don't do Twitter or any of those others. TikTok, I don't, <laughs> I don't TikTok. <laughs> well, do you, do you incorporate it in your, you know, you talk about how you have this daily schedule. Do you incorporate it into, okay, this, now I'm going to do this and now I'm going to do that. It's no. just whenever it hits you. 
Yeah, it's just whenever I get a chance to. And I do try to reply if people make a comment to me. I try to reply in a fairly timely way. But sometimes I, I won't check my Instagram for a while and somebody might have said something and I, I haven't yet replied. But I do try to reply to comments that I get. Well, Betty Womack wants to know, she graduated from Georgia Southern College with an art education degree in 1968 had a professor that understood her art interest. They purchased looms after she graduated. She said she was so disappointed, but she heard the looms went to North Georgia. Do you know if those are the used looms you guys have? Georgia State, um, not Georgia State, um, uh, West, yeah, uh, Georgia, Southern. Georgia, Southern? Georgia Southern. Yes, okay. yes, those looms are at North Georgia College, or rather University of North Georgia and still in use. There you yes. go. There you go, Betty. Um, Gail Valance wants to know, do you prefer a certain type of bobbin for weaving? Yes. Oh, I use a Gobelin style bobbin. <laughs> and I, of course, I've got hundreds of them, but I don't have one here. <laughs> I'm going to run away just like oh, that. Okay. Everybody Nobody, does I, that. Yeah, everybody does. I Nobody know. I, I have that effect on people. To show Kathy. <laughs> I love it because now we can see the, the tapestries behind you. Yeah. This and, one is uh, Kathy Todd Hooker's pieces. Can you see that one? Yeah. Oh, is that Kathy Todd Hooker's? That's Kathy Todd Hooker's, yeah. Ah, okay. I use these. Okay. Can you see those? These yeah. are Dublin style. I get them from several different places. And I've got some tinier ones too, but these these are the, the kind I use mostly. Sue Horn says, I'm in Shetland, Scotland. The tradition is wonderful woolen spun yarn. How important is it to embrace the local tradition when it's regarded as better to work with worsted spun yarn? I don't know a lot about yarn quality difference in, uh, I, I don't know enough information to answer that question. In my work, I use whatever seems to fit the bill. So sometimes I've mentioned those particular yarns that I use primarily, but sometimes I will add a strand of linen with it, thin, linen or cotton. Um, so I am not a yarn specialist. I'm sorry, I can't answer that um, intelligently. <laughs> well, hello, Scotland. It's lovely to have you here. Well, I can't believe it. We have to stop. It's time to stop for today. I can't thank you enough for being here, Tommy. It's been delightful. And I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your ideas. And it's been wonderful having you here. Thanks. Thank you. And I appreciate it very much. And I appreciate Schiffer and Schiffer uh, Craft for this. Uh, quick answer to a question that just popped up. I weave oh, okay. on, a, uh, on, a, on a, an upright, uh, a vertical tapestry loom. Oh, here's another one too. Okay, for your realism, this is from Don Klug. From your realism style of tapestry, what is your main structures? Dovetail meet and separate? I was a photo realism painter for 30 years before becoming a weaver 26 years ago and began tapestry four years ago. Fabulous. And I am a quadriplegic and I can weave on a custom HD loom. Wow, yeah. I, I don't use interlocks. I use slit tapestry, meet and separate, and I um, um, stitch the slits as I go, uh, according to Susan Martin Maffe and Archie Brennan's um, oh, okay. methods. And those are those are found online. So. Um, so you said you do a vertical loom? A vertical loom, a bright oh. loom. Did you ever have a horizontal? Did you ever use a? I, I have a horizontal. I have a Maycumber eight shaft Maycumber that I weave, weave on. I thought. But, yeah. <laughs> All right. I do want to thank um, Schiffer. 
uh, for being a sponsor today, but um, but also I remind people, if you want to see more of her beautiful work, go to www.scanlantapestries.com. And there's so much uh, information about Tommy. Um, you can keep track of what she's up to. Um, and again, check out um, the John C. Campbell, because she does teach up there, right? Are you teaching this year? I am not teaching this year. Uh, there, I just finished an online class with them two weekends ago. Okay, uh, okay. Paper weaving. <laughs> All right. She will be at Convergence. Come see her there. And like yes. I said, there's that beautiful exhibit that's going to be at um, Maryville, Tennessee. Uh, right. And I'll be in the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll be in the shipper booth at some point. You'll be signing, book. signing your books. Yeah, we will announce that at Convergence, those times. Uh, so you can get, come by and get your own autograph. Do you want to thank Schiffer for being our sponsor today? And again, they are doing a brilliant idea. They're going to give away two of Tommy's books. Um, you need to, scan, to uh, click on the link and there's a form there that you fill out. And then at the end of the month, on the 31st of May, they will do a drawing and give away two of Tommy's books. Thank you so much, Schiffer. That's a great idea. We really appreciate it. Not only do we appreciate you sponsoring Textiles and Tea, but all the publishing that you do for fiber artists. We, um, you really, a lot of our former printers have gone out of style and out of business and you've stuck with the fiber industry and we want, really appreciate that. If you're looking for a good fiber book, Schiffer Craft Publishing. If you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your guild, um, or your business, go to our website, weavespandye.org, and you can get the information about being a sponsor for Textiles and Tea. If you like the programming that you're seeing here, um, the programming that we've had recently with the Guild Retreat, um, the new ones that we're doing now with the leaders talking about their group, their classes that they're going to have at Convergence, Come sponsor us through <laughs> not just textiles and tea, but sponsor all of that through donating to the Fiber Trust and or becoming a member. And you can do all of that at weavespendie.org. If you've missed any episodes or you want to watch them again, and I'm sure you're going to watch Tam, Tommy's again, uh, you can go to the Facebook page, the HGA Facebook page. And uh, you can watch them there. You can watch. You don't have to have a Facebook account. I know a lot of people don't like that. You can just go in and watch them. We also are on YouTube and uh, you can watch the episodes there. Um, we have some events coming up with uh, Convergence coming up. Don't forget, we've got Sheep to Show. We are looking for teams. Get your buddies together. Get a spinner. Uh, get a weaver, get together and join our sheep to shop. It's so much fun. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Don't forget, we also have to meet and greet at Convergence. If your guild, any nonprofit or a school would like to have a booth at the meet and greet, it's a great way for people to find you. Um, some people were saying how much fun it was. To, if they knew they were going to Utah, they could find the Utah Guild out there at the meet and greet and talk to them and see what was coming up. It's an opportunity for schools and nonprofits to promote their upcoming events. We've got a lot of conferences next year and we would love to hear about them. That again will be a meet and greet, will be at Convergence. We have Thread Talks. If you've heard of TED Talks, well, we're Thread Talks. If you have a concept, a topic that you would like to share with people, again, contact us at wespendie.org, and we would love for you to take uh, some time on the stage and talk about that concept or topic. We're doing a skein exchange this year. The towel exchange was so popular that we're doing a skein exchange this year. Again, you can find information and sign up for that at wespendie.org. All of that is available with a day pass and you get it free with your Convergence value package. Next up, we will see, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we have the Convergence 2022 leaders. We're meeting with them and hearing about their classes. We've got three more uh, on the books right now. We may have more later, April the 14th at 4 p.m. 
April the 15th at 5 p.m. and April the 18th at 4 p.m. All of this information is also on the website at wespendie.org. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these yet, we have five or six teachers and they talk about their classes. Um, sometimes they'll have a video or a PowerPoint and show you images of the classes. So if you're still trying to decide what you wanna take at Convergence, we haven't quite made up your mind. Here's a good chance to see some of these classes. I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. I hope you have a great week. Um, it's spring here in Atlanta. I know it's getting to be spring other places too, except while it goes somebody in the chat said it's hailing, I think in Virginia. So have a great week. Next week, we are going to have um, Heather Hitala. Um, she does some beautiful artwork. I'll look her up if you get a chance before next week. Happy tea, everyone.